Hi, I'm Max Rudin, president and publisher of Library of America, and welcome to this Library of America event. For those who don't know, Library of America is a nonprofit publisher and cultural institution dedicated to publishing authoritative new volumes of great American writers and to keeping the multi-voiced American literary tradition a vital part of our culture for readers and writers to discover and rediscover. We're grateful to our partners this evening, the Carnegie Council for Ethics International Affairs, the American Conservative, and the New Republic. A special welcome to Library of America fellows and members who support our mission. This event marks publication of American Conservatism, Reclaiming an Intellectual Tradition, a collection of 44 writers and thinkers from Henry Adams to Antonin Scalia and Wendell Berry. The book is edited by Andrew Basevich, who joins us this evening. What is American conservatism? What are the core beliefs and values that animate it as a tradition of political thinking? Do they help us to understand the current administration, which claims to be conservative, and the conservatives who oppose it? Does the conservative, conservative tradition include values and aspirations that Americans who don't identify as conservative might share? What answers can these writings offer to fundamental questions about the common good, the quest for a society that is just and decent, the purpose of freedom, the responsibilities of citizenship, America's role in the world at this critical moment in our history? These are the guiding questions of the book and the conversation tonight. To discuss and debate them, we're very fortunate to have with us this evening, Andrew Basevich in conversation with Sean Malentz. Andrew Basevich is president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible, for Responsible Statecraft. A graduate of the US Military Academy and Princeton University, he served as an officer in the US Army for 23 years. His recent books include The Age of Illusions, How America Squandered Its Cold War Victory, The Limits of Power, and America's War for the Greater Middle East. His writings have appeared in the New York Times, the London Review of Books, and the American Conservative, among other publications. Sean Malentz is the George Henry Davis 1886 Professor of American History at Princeton University. His numerous books include the Rise of American Democracy, Jefferson to Lincoln, which won the Bancroft Prize and was a finalist for the Pulitzer. No Property in Man, Slavery and Anti-Slavery at the Nation's Founding, and Bob Dylan in America. He edited the just published Library of America volume, Richard Hofstetter, Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, The Paranoid Style in American Politics, and on Collected Essays, volume number 330 in the Library of America series. Andy and Sean will talk for about 40 minutes and invite your questions. You can submit a question or comment at any time by using the Q&A button on your menu bar. If you wish, let us know where you're viewing from. And now, please welcome Andrew Basevich and Sean Mullins. Well, thank you, Max. Uh, we can't hear you all out there, but it's wonderful to be here with all of you now and obviously with Andy and Max. And we're here to talk about uh, this marvelous new book, important new book, um, at a very peculiar, difficult time. Um, Andy, in your introduction, you say that we, we stand at, a, America stood at a crossroads, and I don't think you had, could have had any idea how much of a crossroads you're gonna be standing at when, uh, when the book actually appeared. Um, and, and that's going to be in our minds, no matter what. I mean, there's no way to, to, to avoid that. But I don't want to simply dwell on that. I want to range around and talk about the ideas that are in this book, um, what American conservatism is, might be, could be. Let me start, though, Andy, with, with your, your subtitle, actually, Reclaiming an Intellectual Tradition. Um, that asserts that there is an intellectual tradition, which we'll talk about, but reclaiming. Reclaiming from whom, why, what has to be reclaimed? What, where, who does that have to be taken away from? 
Well, thanks also for including me in this. And I have to say thanks uh, to Max and his team at the Library of America for asking me to do this project. It's, it's, it's not my typical sort of, uh, of uh, book, and I'm grateful to have the chance to do it. I think the answer to the question, Sean, is to save the American conservative tradition from the fraudulent conservatives who have hijacked that tradition uh, in, in recent years have so sullied uh, the word conservative uh, that it's, it's increasingly difficult for Americans to, to take seriously the proposition mm -hmm. that there is a conservative tradition. Mm -hmm. Now I'm with you, I don't wanna kind of get all hung up in what's happened in the last 72 right. hours, uh, but it does seem to me that uh, Trump, the leader of the Republican Party, ostensibly the party of conservatism, ostensibly himself a conservative, has utterly trampled on conservative values, in particularly with regard to a, a subject that is near and dear to my heart, which is the relationship between uh, the nation uh, and the American uh, armed services. Uh, so I think, I think we're trying to save, we're trying to restore a tradition that has been uh, despoiled mm -hmm. by people who claim to be conservatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I was gonna add, it tramples on a, on a tradition you call conservative, but actually I think it's shared by liberals as well, which is the principle of the rule of law has also been trampled on by, by this president. And it's certainly something that is not a conservative thing to do. And, and, I, and I, I would expand on that just a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. uh, The, the tradition of a professional military that is apolitical, that sees its primary loyalty to the Constitution, even though, of course, military officers are sworn to obey the orders of the commander in chief. I think that that notion, the notion of duty, honor, and country, a, co a code of conduct, which is really a, more an aspiration than a code, is deeply conservative. And yet, to your point, is an aspiration that liberals can endorse and can appreciate, can appreciate the importance if a, if a nation that is committed to being a great military power needs to have a military that is apolitical and it focuses on on preparing to fight wars not to bring order uh, to american cities in a time of of great crisis well i do want to get to more of the overlap between conservatism and liberalism especially at this time as well as the differences but let me just start with the questions actually two questions and it's a matter of, of emphasis as many things are I wanted to ask you first, what is American conservatism? And then what is American conservatism? If you see what I'm saying. Let me start with the second of those. Um, American conservatism, what is American conservatism? We know what it's not very early on in, in, in your book. It's not a doctrine. It's not a set of, you know, uh, um, what? Um, uh, it's not a dogma. Yeah. It's rather something closer to a series of attitudes, ideas, it's a batch of things out there. And uh, we can go through them, we will go through some of them, community, the respect of law, all of those things. But I'm wondering, what holds them all together? I mean, what, what is there that can be seen as the glue that holds these various things together as distinctively conservative? That's a difficult question. Sorry. <laughs> And I, I think my answer would be a particular concept of the human person mm -hmm. as flawed and therefore from that point of departure, conservatives are gonna be somewhat skeptical to propositions of perfectibility conservatives are going to be wary of big projects 
that proposed to bring about a radical transformation of our consciousness. You know, one of the people that I included in this book, one of my absolute, total, complete favorite writers is Reinhold Niebuhr. I'm pretty sure Niebuhr never classified himself as a conservative. But his Christian realism, if we take that as kind of the core of what he believed in and, and wrote about, with this continuing warning to be aware of your own flaws, the nation's flaws, and, and, and therefore, in embarking upon some project to to deal with evil, never to lose sight of the fact that, that you yourself, our nation, is also subjected to, to what he would have called sin. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think this question of human perfectibility and a human person mm -hmm. is at, this, at the center of what, what I understand American conservatism to be about. Mm -hmm. That's interesting though. I, I... I mean, I'm a Niborian myself, and in this, to the extent that, and, and, I th and, and Niebuhr had a tremendous impact on Cold War liberals, as you know, I mean, North yes. and so forth. So the idea of humility in the face of politics and understanding your own limitations, and there is no perfectibility, and that he or she who preaches perfectibility is going to lead you to damnation. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's something I think that we, sh we share. Okay, well, let me change it though, shift the emphasis to what is American conservatism. And, in some ways, you know, America was a nation that was born in revolution, revolution from an old world, a revolution from, well, and, and has turned um, the rejection of tradition in many ways into a kind of national pastime, if you will. Right? Um, I'm wondering what does it mean to be a conservative, what does American conservatism mean? What does it mean to have a conservatism in a, revol in a, in a, in a nation formed in revolution? Uh, let me put it slightly differently. One of the people that Ronald Reagan most liked to, to quote, when he wasn't quoting FDR, <laughs> he loved to quote Tom Paine. He was always quoting Tom Paine. And he would say that, he'd always quote Paine's line from Common Sense, that we have it in our power to make the world over again. Now, that doesn't sound like a very conservative <laughs> idea. And yet it was Ronald Reagan's credo in some ways when he was speaking. So I'm wondering, that, 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 that gets at the question I'm asking you is, what does it mean to be conservative, conservative in, a, in a revolutionary nation? Well, and of course, it's not only Tom Paine, but then also uh, John Winthrop that he loved to yes, uh, quote, yes, the, city the, the famous the yes. city upon a hill. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I guess, I guess the, a, a preliminary response would be, don't take Ronald Reagan's conservatism at face value. Uh, I think in many respects, if we look at, his domestic political role, mm -hmm. uh, cutting the size of government, hostility to taxes, uh, that's conservative. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to foreign policy, he was a crusader. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, uh, he, he would, he, his policies would not have found favor with uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, mm -hmm. I, I venture to say. But let's go back to the revolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're the historian, more, much more than I am. But I guess I've come to believe that our, our, our revolution was peculiar. And in, in some senses, it was less than revolutionary. It was not radical. The aim of, the overarching aim of the revolution was to preserve a distinctive society, this collection of 13 colonies that had evolved organically in the new world. And my sense is that the revolutionaries, among other things, were intending on protecting that and mm -hmm. protecting that distinctive society that they themselves has evolved, had evolved. And in that sense, I mean, the revolution, the American Revolution was a revolution, but it was not a revolution anywhere near as radical as, let's say, the French Revolution or the Bolshevik Revolution or the Chinese Revolution. 
So there is a, there is a conservative element in the revolution uh, that, I, that I think persists. Well, you would see a conservative tradition maybe arising from the likes of say John Adams, you know, or Governor Morris. In other words, the conservatives who are also revolutionaries but wanted to restrain yes. um, the, the revolutionary forces. I get that. But at the same time, there is at the heart of the American Revolution, and it's at the heart of the Declaration of Independence, and it's the heart of all that is radical or liberal, whatever you want to call it, which is the principle of equality. The principle that all men are created equal, which in the 18th century context, when Jefferson wrote that, those words, it was as radical as you could possibly be. You see what Fair I'm enough. saying? Fair enough. Running against an entire set of sense of hierarchy and of order that had been inherited from the old world. I'm not disputing what you're saying. I'm, I'm trying to get at both sides of the revolution to see how the, the radical liberal side is in tension with the more conservative side and to see them as both together. That you really can't want to understand one without the other. I think that's my, my view of the whole thing. Um, but but is, it me, not, me, yeah, Sean, is it not, Sean, is it not the case? And this is a failing of conservatives. I think it's also characteristic of liberals or progressives, mm -hmm. whatever we call them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we find in the past what we what we wish to find there. Uh, you know, we, we, we find in the past uh, themes that validate our particular disposition, uh, point of view. Uh, I guess that's one of the things that makes history interesting because you can have we can have a we can have disagreement about what the what the American Revolution signifies. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, though, speaking as an historian, I, I have to say as a pro, as it were, I, I, that's, a, that's a temptation I fight against every single day. What? You fight against what? Why? Because I think that, is, as, as we historians say, we have to respect the pastness of the past. Um, if, if, unless you're willing to understand the past on its own terms, then you end up simply finding what you want to find. And, and that's a real danger, I think, in, in, in intellectual history. Oh, oh no, I, 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 I certainly concede. Okay. We could talk about the 1619 project here if you want to, finding <laughs> right. what you want to see. But, but right. is, is it honest historians, that is to say, those who embark upon a study of the past without some preconceived agenda that they're going to try to jam down others' throats, honest right. historians, are, are they not engaged in an argument? Sure. What, what, what does it mean, this, mm. this event, this moment? And, and honest historians are going to bring to that argument varied perspectives that lead to very fierce disagreements. That makes the whole thing interesting. Uh, absolutely. Um, um, and we, we ask certain questions, and our questions betray our interests. So yeah. there's that difference. However, I, I would just say there is such a thing as objectivity. That is to say, it must be based in facts and logic. And without facts and logic, we're all slaves to that. And that's what you know, distinguishes between the two. But let's get away from history for a sec. Uh, let me put it the same question differently. What would you say is the difference between American conservatism and conservatism elsewhere, say British conservatism or European conservatism? We're all, you know, ever since World War II in particular, we're all embraced as the West and we all seem to have democratic values that are similar to one another as we face all against totalitarianism. And yet, they can't be identical if we're going to be talking about American conservatism. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are about that. If, if, if you've considered so, so the professor is quizzing me on my knowledge of British <laughs> and European history. <laughs> no, I don't mean to be a, I don't mean to be an inquisitor. I, I just say that no, let me, let me, let me take a shot at it. Okay. Uh, what's what, how is our conservatism different? Yeah. Point number one, we have a declaration and we have a constitution. They are distinctive. Uh, in their time, they were original, mm -hmm. and they are ours. Mm -hmm. And the Brits, Europeans, you name it, they don't have that. Right. Uh, so I think, I think that, that is a, a, the, the foundation of American conservatism, although it also would be true, the foundation of American liberalism mm -hmm. is traceable, I think, to those, to those founding uh, documents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another difference, we have fancied ourselves an anti-imperial nation. 
And the previous great powers prior to World War II, through the 18th and 19th centuries, were imperialists, mm -hmm. consciously, admittedly, proudly, mm -hmm. engaged in the building of empires. We have always fancied that we're not engaged in the building of an empire. Now, we actually have been, <laughs> but we won't admit it out loud. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think th that too uh, becomes an element, a, 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 a mechanism to say, we are not like them. Mm -hmm. And I think that also then informs the differences between American conservative conservatism and uh, various European conservatisms. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Okay. All right. Well, um, another aspect of your book that's interesting, and I want to dwell on this for, in a couple of, for a couple of questions, is that you start your intellectual tradition you're reclaiming in 1900. I mean, the earliest text here is Henry Adams um, you know, from the education. Um, he's, re he's remembering a, a, uh, an exhibition he vi visited in 1900, and he's talking about the dynamo. Those of you who've read Henry Adams will know this, a very famous passage. And he just feels that history is, is, is moving much too fast, that you know, the machinery and the speed and, and so forth. And the, what you, you actually quote Weber, um, the, 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 the uh, what is it, the, um, the disenchantment of the world that's going on, that this is at the heart of con the conservative tradition that you want to reclaim, right? But I was just wondering again, and this maybe it, it, it evokes Ronald Reagan in some ways. There are plenty of places you can find that, you know, and, and, and you have very eloquent and powerful examples of that in the book. I mean, you've got the Southern agrarians, You've got um, Robert Nisbet, who is, you know, a communitarian of sorts, um, well, not of sorts, a communitarian. You have a kind of classicism as well, which I, I appreciate it. I mean, there's, a, I suppose, the Alan Bloom strain in American conservative thought, although Bloom never said he was a conservative. He always denied it. But, but the idea that there is this, you know, there, there are, are great books out there. There are great ideas that should not be trashed on, on political, for political reasons, all of that. And in all of those, you get a sense of a kind of, yes, a, a reflex against modernity. And yet, when I think of conservatism also, in terms of, I don't know, Milton Friedman maybe, or um, others like that, you know, it's much more, it's very pro-capitalist, and capitalism dissolves all of those. those yes. Those, 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 it's very anti-modern. So, so how do we square the two, or, or can we? I mean, you just have to agree yeah, that, that, that conservatives are going to come in these two varieties, or is there a way we can square the circle? I don't think we can square the circle. I think, they, I think conservatives come in a, in a multitude of varieties. Mm -hmm. the, and the, the object of the book uh, is not to assemble a series of writings mm -hmm. that cohere, mm -hmm. uh, where a person could read the book from the start to the end and say, aha, I can now define the four things that conservatism stands for. Because, because it, it contains, con the conservatism contains contradictions. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to present those contradictions to the reader, allow the reader to, uh, to reflect on them. But as you said at, at the outset of the conversation, uh, you know, this is not a dogma. I'm not making that claim, but it is a disposition. It's a, it's a tendency. And, and I think it is a disposition that we can distinguish from a liberal or progressive tendency. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's all I'm trying to do is to, is, is to, is to, to present it in, in its fullness, as it were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny. I mean, it strikes me. There's an anti-modern strain in liberalism as well. And, and um, I mean, you can see it in all kinds of places. Um, it's not as if liberalism is the incarnation of modernity. Um, it seems to me though that, that they have a different set of concerns about what kind of breaks, if you will, they want to put on this modern world. That the, the conservative view is much more, has much more to do with um, morality, has much more to do with um, um, things of the spirit as in the disenchantment of the world. Um, whereas the liberals will be much more uh, prone to talk about material objects, material things, you know, um, um, inequality, things like that, right? But there is yes. 
both a, cri a critique of capitalism. It's just that, you know, um, they, they, they start from different places um, and they may end up in different places, but there is this place where they, where they kind of have a sense that, you know, all is not well with the world. It goes to what Daniel Bell wrote about, a great, I guess, I guess a great liberal who sometimes was thought of as a conservative, but was a social thinker, to talk about the cultural contradictions of capitalism and that, that capitalism does have these contradictions in it, and, but that liberals and, and conservatives are both going to get it, but are going to see it from different angles. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Now, uh, to, the, to the average person uh, walking down the street, I'm guessing that they will assume that all conservatives embrace capitalism, mm -hmm. that, that capitalism is of the right. right. And one of the points I'm trying to make in the book is to show that there among conservatives, there is this ambiguity about the consequences of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, conservatives are not socialists. Conservatives you know, believe that the market creates wealth. Right. Conservatives also, at least genuine conservatives in my view, have an awareness of the corrosive effect of the market on, on human values that conservatives cherish. And, in, and I think that, you know, and we, there'd be differences, but that liberals cherish as well. Looking at, I mean, just to give our, our viewers, uh, our web, web, webinar viewers, a, a sample of what's in the book. I mean, who would you pick out of those that you assembled? Who would you, who would you pick out as an exemplar of that kind of anti-capitalist conservatism, if you will, or critical of capitalism conservatism? Uh, Wendell Berry, mm -hmm. uh, an agrarian, as I think you mentioned a couple of minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Eugene Genovese. Mm -hmm. uh, American historian, mm -hmm. a communist, yep. card carrying uh, as, a, as a radical young uh, historian who gravitated to the right. In many respects, I think his move to the right either stemmed from or expressed itself as a certain sympathy with Southern thinkers. Mm -hmm. Now he wasn't a racist. He wasn't, you know, buying into the old South. Mm -hmm. But I think he found value mm -hmm. in the critique of industrial capitalism mm -hmm. that Southern thinkers evolved to some degree, honestly, to some <laughs> degree, also probably to justify the uh, the preservation of slavery. Mm -hmm. But Genovese, I think, found value in that. And, and that's why he too, I think, is a conservative who has very interesting critical things to say about capitalism. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it is interesting that you'll find, you're gonna find people, when you pick this book up, as I hope you all will, you're gonna find authors in here that you may not have expected to be in a book on American conservatism. Not so much Gene, who is a good friend and I watched him move to the right, um, but, um, and, and, and remain perfectly consistent at the same time. Um, that was what was so interesting about um, but you're going to find Reinhold Niebuhr. You're going to find Wendell Berry. You're going to find all kinds of people you might not have expected, precisely because they, I think, that they reflect ideas which conservatives value, even if the person might not uh, align him or herself on that, that part of the political spectrum. I mean, another, another person that I, if, if I may, yeah. that uh, illustrates that is Randolph Bourne. Ah, yes. Uh, to his mind, there's no doubt about it that he was a progressive. His sympathies were, his cultural sympathies were very much on the left. As a young journalist, he's, he's writing for the New Republic back when the New Republic was young and was very much on the, on the left. Mm -hmm. But for him, the US entry into World War II was a break point. And his, famous, his famous quotation, war is the health of the state. Uh, and, and although a progressive really becomes the patron saint of American libertarians, mm -hmm. because his wariness of, a, of state power, self-aggrandizing state power, and his wariness of how war destroys uh, culture, 
and, and, and human values. So he too never, never would have voted for Ronald Reagan, uh, but, to, but to my mind, very much deserved to have a part in this, uh, in this project. It's particularly Bourne's anti-militarism. I mean, he, the piece that you pick out is about the state, the state as distinct from government and from administration. There's this other thing that comes to the fore, particularly in times of war. But it is, it's not that he's a, simply a pacifist. It's not about that. It's about an anti-militarism, which drives yes. part of his political theory, I think. And that's, well, I want to get on to foreign policy in a little bit too. But, but let, me, let me stick with, um, with, maybe with Gene Genovese for a second, or with um, another a term or another, what, rubric under which you would put, um, or, or another set of conservative values, and that would be community, community in particular. The idea of, again, it, 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 it has to do with um, resisting the atomizing effects of, 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 of our life. We have to have, you know, these local bonds very often. It's, it's very much along those lines. Yep. Um, well, I mean, again, there's a tension here, right? I mean, because, because deep in con the conservative tradition is also the idea of individualism, as it is deep in the American tradition. Yep. Full, full stop. So there's always going to be this tension between, you know, a love of community and the idea of individualism, of libertarian, if you will. Libertarianism, if you will. That's another one. Um, but let me, let me dig a little deeper, though, because there is something that I think um, is in the back of people's minds that we, we have to talk about to be honest about it. And that's just the extent to which when you're talking about Richard Weaver, who you, who you include in the book, yep. um, when you talk about Gene Genovese, to be sure, when you talk about John Crow Ransom and the, the Southern agrarians, yep. there, there's, a, there's a talk, it's, it's, it's not just community, it's a particular kind of Southern community. It's, a, it's, it's, it's tied to a region in America, at least in their writings. Among the agrarians, yes. Yes, so it's rural, it has that localism to it, Yep. Here's my question. I understand why you, you wanted to start the book in 1900, right? But, you know, it's not as if conservative ideas, these ideas in particular about community, suddenly were born as a reaction to modernity. I mean, there's a kind of pre-modern version of anti-modernity, if you see what I'm saying. And I was wondering why, you know, why you made that decision to, 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 to start in 1900. Um, for example, I was just going through the index, and indexes are not the best measure, I understand. It's just, it's, it's just a way of looking at it. But many of the people that you include in the book certainly were looking back to the, to the 19th century for inspiration. I mean, I, I did a quick count, and you know, there, there are more references to John C. Calhoun, there are more references, that, and almost as many references to George Fitzhugh as there are to Ronald Reagan and many more than to either William Howard Taft or Robert A. Taft. There is the sense in which the people you're writing about certainly think of themselves as part of a tradition that goes back before 1900 and does go back to the Civil War. And it must give us pause and must give us, you know, um, um, uh, it is troubling because, you know, that tradition for all of the things that we can pluck from it was in the end, as you say, you know, much more tied to the cause of the Confederacy than the cause of the Union. And that this gets at aspects of conservatism, which I think you know we have to talk about, which you do talk about in the book in terms of race, but I'm thinking about in terms of its historical development. In other words, is there a connection between what was going on then and what was going on, what, what happened after 1900, or was there something such a great break that, that, that it really wasn't the same? My impression is there's more continuity than discontinuity. I think that's probably true, although I probably have to think about it longer than we have time. Right. But there is a very specific answer as to why the book starts in 1900. And that is we have to blame Max. <laughs> <laughs> Always blame your editor, right, 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 right. No, this was actually a very important insight. Uh, when we were first talking about putting this together and we're trying to figure out when to start it. Right. And Max's insight, which I think is exactly correct is if you go back much before 1900, conservatives are going to claim all the big thinkers or the most significant figures as conservatives, mm -hmm. and the liberals are going to do the same. Oh, I see. Everybody's going to claim George Washington. Everybody's going to claim Abraham Lincoln. Right. Right. And, and so arbitrarily, I mean, it really was uh, arbitrary. Okay. It, it seemed like... Uh, 1900 plus or minus however many years was a good 
start point. Mm -hmm. And also, and I, you know, I, I wouldn't want to go very far down making this argument, mm -hmm. but more or less around 1900, that's when the, when the industrial juggernaut mm -hmm. of modern day capitalism, which certainly pre-existed before 1900, mm -hmm. but it's around 1900 when uh, the stops come off uh, and, and capitalism's full effects really begin to, to make their mark. Now, now, again, we could say, well, why not 1890? Why not 1877? But it seemed to make sense to, to focus on the more recent past and to try to identify the, the dimensions of conservative thought that appeared in response. That's why I begin by saying, and, and you know, the, uh, people will disagree. But my view is that conservatism, American conservatism, did emerge as a, re as a reaction to modernity. That conservatives, again, not, you know, not, not, not Milton Friedman, <laughs> right. but, 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 but the conservatives have always been wary, somewhat troubled by all that modernity has brought to America, the impact of modernity on American society. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's why I'd answer the question. Mm -hmm. But I think, I mean, you, you were kind of, maybe you were not being as blunt as you might have been. As I sometimes am, yes. But I think you were asking whether or not, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. uh, does conservatism somehow bear the imprint mm -hmm. of, of racism? Well, of, 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 of the Confederacy or of, or of the, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, and the, and let, me, let, me, let me intervene, Andrew. And the reason I say Confederacy specifically is that it's, more than, it's about more than racism. It's about a social structure. It's yep. about larger social structures that are based on that. When we talk about states' rights, for example, when we talk about localism, I mean, these have, have, have resonances in American history that go beyond yep. you know, um, some states' rights, if you see what I'm saying. And that's what I'm wondering about, not necessarily going back, you're absolutely right, everybody's going to claim Lincoln, everybody's going to claim Washington. My interest is more to, test, more to do with how those ideas resonate today among cer certain conservatives and how they are used, a usable past, if you will. Well, okay. And, and, I, think, and, I, think for, and I think, for example, of a man I knew a bit, I, I wish I'd gotten to know him longer he, at Yale, who was one of the Southern agrarians, who was, who was Robert Penn Warren. And, and Red Warren and I had once had a long conversation about this, about his evolution, you know, from the kind of, of, of stance that he was taking in the 30s to what he went through in the 50s and 60s and having to understand how the tradition that he had, had valorized was more complicated and had to come to terms with the race question. And, 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 and watching his evolution, I think, was an instruction to me about how ideas actually operate in a, you know, in a very intelligent person. Um, so, so yes, I'm wondering about all of those things, and, and it's it's a burden I think that America bears, but I think that American conservatives bear in a particular way. I have to agree with you. Uh, you know, and this and this is uh, to some degree where we end up then then confronting what appears to be conservative conservatism right. today in America which clearly is tainted with uh, racism mm -hmm. and intolerance, mm -hmm. uh, bluntly a belief in white supremacy. Right. Maybe I'm making a self-serving argument here, but my argument is that those people do not qualify as genuine conservatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they, they may be throwbacks, they are throwbacks to a mm -hmm. conservative perspective mm -hmm. that existed in 1850 or 1890, or probably 1950. 1950. Uh, George Wallace is conservative in a, in a way. He's a Democrat, in, but he's in a, in a way. Uh, yeah, may, you know, may, maybe, you have, maybe you've identified a weakness on my part that I'm trying to, you know, I, I, I don't, 
I, I certainly did not set out to sanitize and simplify conservatism. I set out to try to say, here it is mm -hmm. in all its glory or absence of glory. Mm -hmm. I mean, to get away from race, for example, you know, I included one of my favorite, <laughs> one of my favorite historians of yore uh, is, uh, is, is Beard. Yes. Uh, and so I included, uh, in many respects, probably an infamous uh, essay by yeah. Charles Beard arguing against U.S. intervention in the European war. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are these elements of conservatism that will, will not find favor uh, in the 21st century. Right. But I was doing my best to try to say, here it all is. And mm -hmm. I think, I truly believe, taken as a whole, what we have in this book is a body of literature that is not, and it's not intended to convert an individual mm -hmm. uh, so that they'll you know, vote for uh, Donald Trump, right. but is intended to suggest that there is an alternative perspective that can have value to us mm -hmm. in this enormously difficult time uh, that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to talk more about that as a conclusion, but before we do that, I wanted to go on to, you know, one of the things I most admire about your writing, Andy, is it has to do with foreign policy and, and um, you know, conservative ideas, American conservative ideas about America's role in the world. And that forms a very important, you know, theme throughout the book. Um, and you make the case that you know, conservatives are for prudence, are for you know, are, are anti-imperialists in effect, right? That they that the idea of nation building and so forth. They, they uh, should be. They should be. That's, that's <laughs> what, that's what However, you begin the chapter, and I think George Will may have picked up on this too. You begin your chapter on America's place in the world with Teddy Roosevelt, who's not exactly Mr. You know, Mr. Big Stick, who's not exactly um, a retiring <laughs> figure when you talk about America's role in the world. So. And then I was thinking about something else that was more troubling. I mean, well, I, can I can I interrupt there? Yes, I, please. I think Teddy Roosevelt is a man of many parts. Okay. Uh, and yet, Teddy Roosevelt was a racist imperialist. Uh, but Teddy Roosevelt was also this exemplar of what, in those days, would have been called manly values of a traditional masculinity. Now I know even as I, those words come from my mouth, I understand how retrograde that all sounds. Right. But uh, I do believe that that, that that notion of a particular notion of masculinity uh, does form part of the conservative tradition. It's obsolete today, but again, the purpose of the book was not to sort of say, this is what conservative is today, right. but, but to I, say, I, this is what it's been about. And I think that's why I put uh, Teddy Roosevelt in. So just to clarify, that's a kind of the, the kind of what in England might've been called muscular Christianity. I mean, this idea of, you know, um, Mexican, right, or, right, or, right. Okay, well, let, but let me get to something that was a little bit more troubling, um, which has to do with my own experience. I mean, we're, we're of a certain age, but to me, you know, the most wrenching and formative event in, about, about American foreign policy was the Vietnam War. And, you know, I think you make the point quite plausibly, not only plausibly, quite fairly, you know, that that was a foreign policy disaster in which um, the Cold War liberals, um, you know, my guys, my heroes, um, they didn't get us into it, but boy, they sure escalated it. And boy, they sure made it worse. And I think you use that as an example of, you know, what, um, you know, a liberal hubris to use to use to use yep. uh, hubris conceptions, where that can lead, arrogance in the world, right. and that you call for conservative, you know, a more conservative approach. But here's where it's historically difficult for me because I remember those days. I, I, I must say I don't remember too many conservatives objecting to our mission in Vietnam. Maybe I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'd like to be corrected. But I remember conservatives, in fact, pushing for the war to be escalated even more than. Sure was willing to do. And then it was the liberals, in effect. I mean, starting with the, the new left, but with SDS, but then Martin Luther King, eventually Gene McCarthy, 
Bobby Kennedy, uh, Clinton, Bobby Kennedy. Yep. Who are the ones who stood up against this? So I'm wondering again how that fits into the to, to your conception of what a conservative foreign policy might be about. So it's complicated. Let's back up the story uh, 15 years before uh, mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson uh, Americanizes the war. Mm -hmm. uh, in the early Cold War era, there were conservative critical voices that were challenging, pushing back against uh, this expansion of American military power and taking on new obligations. Who am I talking? I'm talking about Robert Taft. Yes. Okay. We get to the 1952 election. Taft yearns to be the president. Eisenhower says that from a foreign policy perspective, it is essential to maintain the continuity, basic continuity, of the Truman administration's approach to the Cold War. He won for the presidency, he wins. Mm -hmm. And therefore we have, we have, we, we, we now have a, 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 a Cold War foreign policy paradigm mm -hmm. that ends any serious debate mm -hmm. about U.S. foreign policy. There is, no, there is no liberal foreign policy and conservative foreign policy. There's the Cold War. Right. There's American global leadership embraced by both parties. Um, so it is only in my judgment, well, there ought to have been mm -hmm. uh, the emergence of a serious debate over foreign policy when the Cold War finally ended in 1989, mm -hmm. but there was not. Mm -hmm. right. There was not in part because liberals were intent on exploiting this expansive American role in the world under, under the conviction that we could go spread democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think because the people who called themselves conservatives particularly those who flew under the label of neoconservative, were infatuated with American military power and eager to wield it. So again, from my point of view, uh, in, in terms of conservatism, conservative perspectives on foreign policy seriously playing in our politics, it ain't been much. Uh, because there's this, been this consensus in favor of militarized American global leadership. Right, okay. I see that our, our, our Max has rejoined us and I think he has some questions for us and let's get going. Great, um, thank you very much for that. Um, we have some, a lot of questions uh, from our large uh, viewing audience. Um, Roland Hirsch uh, says, you touched earlier on your inclusion of Teddy Roosevelt what guided your selection of American presidents in this volume? That seems to include some less conservative figures like TR and Herbert Hoover, and not some apparently more conservative presidents like Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge. And um, so uh, just wondering how you would respond to Roland. Well, uh, so this is, a, this is a volume of printed works. Of, of ideas. And I wasn't particularly interested in having any presidents whatsoever. The idea wasn't, let's see how many presidents I can get into this thing. But I tried to identify those presidents that had interesting things to say about conservatism. And that's why I ended up with TR and, and Hoover and, uh, uh, and, and, and Reagan. You know, George Will wrote a review of this book and sort of tweaked me because I didn't have a speech, I think it was by Calvin Coolidge. I confess, <laughs> I, was, I was not familiar with that speech by Calvin Coolidge. But I will insist that Calvin Coolidge was not a particularly interesting thinker. Now, that's not a judgment of whether he was a good president or a bad president, but it didn't seem to me that he was a very original thinker and therefore uh, he didn't make the cut. But I think the real point here is I wasn't trying to figure out how many presidents to include. Okay, um, Jason Bartlett asks, which current 
or recent member of Congress best exemplifies the conservative tradition which you honor, I would say, or the traditions, let's say, that you honor in this book? Maybe we should broaden that beyond members of Congress and say public figures. I mean, you take the question any way you'd like. Well, I don't think I can answer it in terms of members of Congress because I don't, you know, you know, follow sort of uh, politics uh, that uh, that closely. I tried to include some still active public intellectuals who I admire uh, greatly. You know, Patrick Deneen of Notre Dame would be one example. Ross Dutha of the of the New York Times. I think both of them are. Uh, very able and interesting thinkers, and that's how they that's how they made the cut. Uh, but <laughs> I, I don't I don't know if I can offhand think of any politician right now that I'm I'm fond of. Sean, are you fond of any politicians right now? I think I'm trying to answer the question. I'm fond of lots of politicians, but they're not conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, um, I'm trying to think though of, of someone like, for example, Connor Lamb, who's a Democrat, but was a, was considered a part of the class of, of, of 2018. But you know, but he was speaking to questions of, of, of patriotism, for example. He was speaking about military issues, I think, in a way that uh, addressed his 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 um, um, his district, his constituents. You know, he was he was in a rel relatively conservative part of Pennsylvania. And I think if you find in the Democratic Party, if you look at the more, um, they call them moderates, I don't know what you want to call them. I think they're more as liberals anyway. But at that end of the Democratic Party, I think you're going to find something closer to what you're talking about, Andy, than anything you'd find in the Republican Party today. I suspect that's true because uh, to express a personal opinion, I think that the Republican Party is so intellectually bankrupt, you know, has so, has, they, the party has sold its soul uh, to to Donald Trump mm -hmm. that I'm sure there are exceptions that I probably should be apologizing to, but it just doesn't seem to me that there are very many members of that party of any significance mm -hmm. who deserve to be classified as principled. Um, John Rahak uh, from Mobile, Alabama, uh, writes uh, that some credit uh, Goldwater, Barry Goldwater, with the arrival of the modern day conservative movement, at least within the Republican Party, followed by Reagan's election in 1980. When did conservatism, <laughs> he asked, I mean, the, he frames it as, when did conservatism get lost from the Republican Party? Is there a defining moment? But I mean, you did talk about the fact that you, you feel, in, in your view, the current Republican Party doesn't reflect conservative values as you understand them. Right. So I guess the question could be put is, when did they part ways? I mean, when did, you know, the tradition as you understand it and the Republican Party part ways? Uh, is there a moment? Is there a defining moment or era? To me, the, the, the aftermath of the, of the Cold War. I have uh, an answer, I think. Pardon me, Sean? I think I have an answer to the question, but, but go, go. I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't No, give, you, give the answer. Newt Gingrich. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I fair think enough. That, I think but that I mean, that, that's not inconsistent with my answer, which was no, no. it happened I, after the end of the Cold I War. But identifying I, a figure, I think you're right. I th I, the, um, they're complementary. I was, I was yes. like jazz. I was chiming in on, on your answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, I think it was Newt Gingrich in 1994. And yep. he had a Bolshevik view of, of politics, which is inconsistent with everything conservatism stands yes. for, Americanism stands for. Mm -hmm. I think he is probably, if you were to pick a single figure to, to blame the ruination of the Republican Party, as much as I disagree with the Republican Party to, in the old days, nevertheless, to its, to its degeneration to what it's become now, Danny described it, I think he's the figure. You are correct. And like Tally Rand, he's still with us. You know, you never can get rid of the guy. You know? yeah. mm -hmm. uh, to take a slightly different tack. So um, Andy, you call yourself a Catholic conservative. And there are many questions about the role of religion in your understanding of conservatism. How, I mean, obviously there, are, you know, religion plays different kinds of roles in conservative thought, in radical thought, in liberal thought, uh, in America and elsewhere. But how, what's your personal connection to your conservative beliefs and your religious beliefs? Well, you know, I, I, 
I, I believe in the sacredness of things. You know, I, I am a believer. And there's no question that uh, if this book had been done by somebody who was not a Catholic, the table of contents probably would have been substantially different. The, 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 the table of contents, the, the selections do reflect my conviction that there is a connection between belief and genuine conservatism. I hasten to add, that does not mean that every conservative has to be a believer. But I suppose that somehow stems from my upbringing. Uh, but I, I did want that uh, element to be included in a book. But again, it, it certainly reflects a personal uh, prejudice. Um, there's a question, what values does conservatism have to offer to younger people who see challenges like climate change as, the, as, the lar as, the, as a large issue looming you know, uh, ahead? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I share that view, that, that concern. Uh, in the introduction, I talk about, you know, I give my own list of, uh, of, of what conservative uh, principles are, again, my view. And I think one of them is that conservatives believe in, this, in, in a sense of stewardship for creation. You know, that we are responsible for conserving, for preserving. Now I say that and I realize again, to the extent that people think the Republican party re re reflects conservative views, there's all kinds of people in the Republican party who are climate change deniers. Uh, I actually believe that climate change may be the, the most important issue where conservatives and progressives can come together to realize a new definition of the common good. Uh, in my judgment, there is no current accepted uh, definition of the common good. And that's to a considerable extent, one of the problems in our society. And I think, I think an, a, a determination to preserve the planet uh, can correct that problem if we recognize it and if, if and if people on the right and people on the left are willing to uh, to embrace that notion can, can i can i just butt in just one little thing and say i i i found it actually very eloquent well, well put in andy really um but if there's a reader as a person in the book that you might want to look to for the spiritual dimension of of conservation i mean read wendell berry i mean uh, yeah it's, it's 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 all there and and um um it's something that everyone can relate to it uh, well said on, on both your parts. Um, maybe we'll, we'll uh, have one more question, and I think this is probably an appropriate one to end on. Um, Peggy Kurkowski, who is, right, who is asking from Denver, Colorado, how does intellectual conservatism, the tradition that you've been discussing tonight, survive the Trump presidency as conservatism as a word and brand, she says, uh, has been tarnished? There's no question it's been tarnished. Uh, I suspect that one of our challenges, uh, your challenges, Max, in, in selling the book is that it has the word conservatism on the front and, and, and that in and of itself is going to alienate some number of people. My own view is that the, the crisis in which we find ourselves currently embedded, which is an economic crisis, it's, it's, a, it's a crisis that relates to an utterly inept and I think corrupt government. A, a crisis of utterly mis, of misguided foreign policy that's plunged us into needless and mismanaged wars. I believe it's also a cultural crisis. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are not going to amend that, I think, without drawing on the conservative tradition reflecting on the ideas of some of the people that are included in this volume, not because they have all the right answers, but because they do have answers that at this particular moment uh, deserve our serious attention. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to, to both of you. Um, you've been listening to Andrew Basevich and Sean Molens discuss American conservatism and the new book, American Conservatism, Reclaiming an Intellectual Tradition, edited by Andy Basevich and published by the Library of America.